to get started. Okay, um, welcome to the webinar. Tonight we are discussing probate and deceased estate administration. So, um, my name is Jackie Broman. I'm the Principal Solicitor at TBA Law and I'm a, an accredited specialist in wills and estates. So, deceased estates administration is um, part of what I enjoy doing. I like helping people through a process that can be quite difficult and making it as seamless as I can um, and hopefully avoid any conflict because I don't actually enjoy um, litigation on deceased estates. And just so you're aware, um, next month the topic will be about um, claims against deceased estates and potentially how to avoid them um, by doing proper estate planning process. So um, that's the next one coming up. So I won't touch too much on um, claims tonight. So what I'm going to do is share... <coughs> my slides and we'll get into it. Okay. So, I'm quite often asked what is probate? Probate is not a death tax. Um, it's not a tax, in fact, at all. Um, it's quite an old fashioned process, which I uh, narrowed down to being in as simple terms as possible, um, a lovely red sealed piece of paper that you get from the Supreme Court to say that the will that is, is valid and to say that um, the executor has the powers to deal with the estate. So that's essentially what probate is. Um, in Victoria, up until January, we were fairly lucky because um, the application fee to the Supreme Court was 325 bucks, no matter what, um, unless it was a really small estate under $100,000. In other states, the court fee um, is based on a percentage of the value of the estate. Since January of this year, the court has changed its fees and it now has set fees depending on the value of the estate. So um, estates under 500,000, I think only pay $60 now. Um, and estates between 500,000 and I think one or 2 million um, pay the 325 and then it goes up from there. So. Most people are caught in either paying a $60 fee or a $325 fee. So it's not, um, it's not a huge amount. Um, it's just an administration, administration process. Probate's not always required when someone passes away. So that's actually something that we assess fairly early on in the piece to see whether the administration of the estate can be done without probate. So just a little bit more about me. I've already introduced myself. Jackie Broman is my name. TBA Law is my firm. We're in central Victoria. Um, as I said, I'm an accredited specialist through the Law Institute. Um, in this particular area of law. Um, so an accreditation is an extra step that solicitors can do. It's a 12 month program to prove extra knowledge in this particular area. And then we have to do a reaccreditation process every two years. There's only about 80 or 90 accredited specialists in Victoria at all. Um, whereas there's about 12,000 solicitors. So there's not that many of us actually. And just a little bit more about me, other than being a solicitor and um, yes, working a fair bit. Um, there's a photo down the bottom there. That's what I do when I relax. Um, my husband, my fur baby, fishing on our boat in Eildon. Um, so we camp on our boat, sleep on it and just have a weekend off the grid every now and then, which is lovely. So, 
when someone passes away, sometimes they'll call us within a couple of days of someone passing to see whether we hold a will and whether there's any important instructions about a funeral or what someone wants done with a body. Um, and otherwise, we can tell them that information, but we can't do much more for them at that point. At that point, we generally tell people, um, look, do what you need to do in terms of a funeral and then sit tight and allow your family to grieve for four to six weeks until the death certificate arrives. Because without that official proof of death, um, legally, we can't proceed and do much. So if there's a dispute about who's organising the funeral, it's actually the executor in, appointed in the will who has firstly the powers over the body um, and therefore the power to um, control what happens to the funeral, whether the body is buried or cremated and where. Um, now, in a will, the only part of the instruction that is actually binding is whether someone wants to be buried or cremated. If someone is cremated against what they want, it's actually a criminal offence and vice versa. Um, and unfortunately, any other instructions about ceremonies and things that people want done or where they want to be buried or where they want their ashes scattered are actually not binding. And so that's why it's quite important to choose your executor wisely because um, your executor may or may not follow your wishes. Um, then to get a copy of the will, we need some kind of proof of death. Now, a death certificate is not available immediately, but because a will is a confidential document, we can't go handing out copies to people just because they say someone's passed away because someone who is dishonest could ring us to try and get a copy of a will and say their parent has passed away when in fact they haven't. So we do need some kind of proof of death. Often there's the medical certificate that the doctor completes and sends in to births, deaths and marriages, which would be sufficient or some kind of notice in the paper. Um, then the people entitled to a copy of the will um, include the executors, any person who's named in the will as a beneficiary, and then also any person who may have been a beneficiary under the laws of intestacy if there wasn't a will. So that includes um, all the children, for example, if some of the children are not named in the will, they're still all entitled to a copy. Um, and then the other thing that is needed during the period after death up until the death certificate arrives is for the executor to secure some of the assets. Particularly if there's family members with access to the property, for example, um, quite often jewellery, cash and other personal items can go missing. So if the family that the executor is dealing with is like that, the executor should change the locks on the house and secure that they should find what paperwork they can in terms of insurance, make sure that everything's insured that needs to be. Um, and they should also start collecting paperwork for any other assets that the deceased person owns. Um, because part of the executor's job is to collect all the assets and we've got to know what assets there are. We can't start the collection process until the death certificate arrives, um, but the executor should be pre-prepared. So they've got four to six weeks after someone passes away to be collating all that information before they uh, seek out a solicitor. Then after the death certificate arrives. So this is when uh, we start accepting appointments from executors so people can, we generally put people off until the death certificate arrives because there's not much that we can do um, unless there's some kind of argument or crisis in the family and things need to be dealt with immediately. 
So we're seeing people, you know, four to six weeks after someone's passed away. Um, on the first appointment, we get all the information we need about who um, who the asset holders are. So lot, what banks, what insurance policies, what super funds, what land, um, all those sorts of things. Um, and then we go through a, a checklist as well with the uh, executor about who they need to write to to tell um, that the person has passed away and we divvy that up so we also um, say well we will contact the banks we will contact the insurance companies we usually contact Vic Roads the super funds um, council water so the executor is often left with um, any local memberships that the deceased has, the electricity and gas and telephone accounts, and usually not much else. Um, it just depends on, I suppose, the age of the person who's passed away and how complex their lives still are. At this point in the first interview with us, we're also determining whether probate is needed or not. Um, and in the case where there's not a will, the equivalent process to probate is called letters of administration. So we determine who is entitled to administer the estate and um, who is entitled under the laws of intestacy if there's no will. So like I said earlier, probate's not always required. And um, if there's smart estate planning, then, for example, in the situation where there's a couple, you would hope that on the death of the first person in the couple, there wouldn't have to be probate. So where assets are jointly held, so a house that has both names on it, joint bank accounts, um, there's only some vehicles and perhaps super, we can deal with the estate without probate. Um, if there is a bank account that is in the deceased person's name solely and it's under $50,000, we can deal with it without probate. Um, and so that's usually uh, the kinds of estates that we can, we can get away from probate with. So where there's joint assets that will pass automatically to the other person or where the estate is small. Otherwise, you're going to need probate to be able to close bank accounts, to be able to get super paid into the estate potentially, and to be able to deal with real estate, to be able to release um, refundable accommodation deposits from aged care facilities, they need grants to release that. Um, so I suppose probate is required in, 50 to 60% of cases when someone passes away. Now, at this point, after the first appointment that we have with someone, we then send a certified copy of the death certificate to all the, all the institutions that hold assets because as the solicitor, it's our job to do the paperwork for the probate and part of that is to establish an inventory of the estate. So we have to write to everyone, determine what everything is worth at the date that the person passed away um, and like I said put together uh, the inventory and get all the paperwork from all the institutions to close accounts. So part of that as well is writing to um, debtors people that are owed money um, so we can write to people and put off the payment and tell them look we are aware of the debt um, we have to get probate there is no money at the moment you have to wait a lot of people are happy to do that uh, sometimes they'll keep writing to us every two weeks to ask us for an update that's fine we manage that um, unfortunately for most bank loans, including mortgages, uh, yes, they will um, not pursue unpaid payments. However, they will continue to accumulate interest until it's paid out. 
So that's why often the sale of the property is quite urgent. Um, real estate can be sold um, or put on the market rather prior to probate. And we just, if, if the property is sold and a contract is signed, we just make that contract subject to probate being granted and settlement being 14 or 30 days after the probate. Um, now, debts do not become the liabilities of the executor. Sometimes an estate can be insolvent. Um, there, in the legislation, there are rules about how an insolvent estate gets dealt with. Um, what creditors are in line first. The fees for the funeral and for the administration of the estate are always paid before debts are paid. Um, and look, sometimes where an estate is insolvent, the executor may not even bother to prove probate if there's insufficient assets to to do that for and potentially someone who's owed money the creditor can apply to administer the estate themselves to try and recover something um, because sometimes the administration of an insolvent estate is just not worth it for the executor so that's something that we consider in the first appointment as well so what we've done, we've had the first appointment, we've written to all the creditors, they have then sent all their paperwork back to us with all the forms they need to have signed to close accounts and to collect all the funds. Um, and they've also given us values for um, everything that the deceased had at the date of death. So then we prepare the inventory and the other documents for probate, we send those draft documents to the executor, we tell them they're ready, they come in and they sign the probate application documents and they sign all the other documents to release all the bank accounts. So we do that all in one appointment so that as soon as probate is granted, we can go ahead and close all the accounts without having to bother the executor to come back in again. So we try and keep it as streamlined as possible. So after probate is granted, if we haven't already written to the beneficiaries and they don't have copies of the will at this stage, this is when we'll write to them, we'll send them a copy of the will, we will tell them that the probate has been granted, um, we will say it'll be a few months until there is money, we'll tell them please don't pre-spend the money, and we'll give them an authority to sign and send back to us, giving us their bank account details for where they want payment when we do have money. So that's what we do for beneficiaries. Um, now we start closing accounts and transferring assets. So uh, bank accounts are fairly easy to close. Superannuation is sort of easy. Um, aged care deposit bonds are very easy. Um, this is the stage also when we do transmission applications to transfer any real estate into the name of the executor. So the executor can then sell it. Um, or potentially the executor needs to transfer it onto a beneficiary. So we start doing all that process. Once we've gathered in everything into our trust account, um, we then do a statement of account and we propose how the funds will be distributed. Now, if funds are held for any period of time because um, we can't collect everything in, for example, um, particularly for you know 10 years after the GFC, there was a lot of investment funds that wouldn't um, pay out, they couldn't. Um, so they had to wait for those funds to dribble in. Um, sometimes where real estate has to be sold, um, it doesn't sell quickly, so we can't distribute an estate straight away. So we can do interim distributions to at least get rid of some of the money. Money that sits in our trust account doesn't earn interest. So if we are holding funds for any period of time, we will potentially tell the executor, look, go and open an estate bank account and transfer the funds into that and then um, open a term deposit. So there's a, at least some interest being earned. 
Now, usually an executor has 12 months um, before a beneficiaries can start jumping up and down. Um, particularly beneficiaries who are left are a specific amount rather than a percentage of the residue. Those beneficiaries can uh, claim interest after 12 months. So we do want to pay cash legacies out as soon as possible. Um, beneficiaries don't have any say in the administration of the estate. So um, quite often, um, you know, beneficiaries can struggle with the fact that they have no control um, and they want constant updates. There's no requirement to give them updates. Um, an executor is required to provide copies of um, certain trust documents that are relevant and to account to them. Um, but beneficiaries have to be aware that every time that's done, it's costing the estate more so they'll get less. So it's a difficult um, balance to weigh between the executor going along and doing their job efficiently and beneficiaries jumping up and down impatiently. Um, and a, a deceased estate takes at least six months in most cases to administer. Um, and that's partly because um, the executor is not obliged to distribute within six months of probate, not of death. So probate can take two or three months usually. And then an executor doesn't have to distribute within six months because someone can make a claim within six months of probate. So if the executor distributes the estate within six months, they can be personally liable. If there's a claim against the estate, they have to either claw back the funds from beneficiaries or pay it out of their own pocket. So we do advise executors not to distribute within six months unless there is absolutely no chance that there is a dispute or claim. Um, tax. So tax does need to be finalised. That is one liability that will become the um, personal liability of an executor if they don't finalise tax. So a final tax return needs to be done for the deceased person and any tax paid or sometimes there's a refund. Um, that's only if the person hasn't been doing returns for quite a few years. If someone's been on a pension for years and has been in aged care, there's no need to do a final return because they haven't done returns for years. Sometimes there also has to be an estate tax return, particularly if there is um, investment properties and there's capital gains tax to pay if investment properties are being sold, or if the estate takes a year or two to wind up and funds have been invested um, while they're waiting to be distributed because the estate will be earning some interest on the, um, the funds that are um, invested. So that's something else to be aware of. And then otherwise, I mean, that's, that's pretty much how we administer it. Like I said, we want to keep it as efficient as possible. We don't like going backwards and forwards constantly to the executor saying, oh, and by the way, this has to be signed. And by the way, we need you to come in again and get this one signed. We like to try and get everything signed all at once. And then we just report back to them as we go, as things are done. Things sometimes arise. Um, where we need some extra bits and pieces signed, but we try and um, streamline it and really only have the first appointment, the signing appointment before probate, and then after that, we have a final appointment to do the distribution. Um, so it's a bit of a short and sweet webinar. We're only really going for half an hour. Um, I will take some questions at the end. Now, these are some of the free resources that you can find on our website, so download. Um, the who, who to notify checklist, we've got an abbreviated version of that, which you can download from our website yourself. So we um, suggest who you need to send a copy of the death certificate to after someone has passed away. 
Uh, we also have an information sheet for beneficiaries, so they can download that. I think it's about five pages long. Um, it gives them information about what a beneficiary is, what their rights are, how long it should take to administer the estate, um, what the process is of administration so that they're not left completely in the dark. And then we have a, um, a guide for executors and trustees, so the people administering the estate themselves. It explains some of the concepts a little bit more thoroughly. Um, talks about what their roles and responsibilities are, also talks about what, what they have to tell beneficiaries and what they don't, um, and it walks them through uh, the process that I've just gone through with you now in this webinar. Um, and there's a diagram in it as well, just for people who are um, more visual than wanting to read the whole document. So those resources are available on our website. Um, on the wills and estate planning services page or um, at the end of a lot of our blogs in this particular in these areas you'll find these um, various download links so do go and check those out um, and share those resources if you need to um, so thank you very much for attending I'm going to stop sharing my slides now and um, I'm going to go back to the Zoom screen to see whether we've got any questions. All right. No questions. So I must have covered things off fairly well. Um, I rattled away fairly quickly though. I hope that I didn't talk too fast. Um, I've recorded this though, obviously, so you can go back and listen to the replay. Um, and that replay will be available in various places, but I'll email you the link directly to where I put it up on uh, YouTube. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording then. Good night. I hope this was valuable.